I'm Elizabeth. I'm a PhD student in Carnegie Mellon University. I'm going to be talking today about WAM, which is a WASM bycode instrumentation DSL. I'm advised by Heather Miller and Ben Tetzer, if you know either of them. Um, let's get started. First off, what is WAM? Is it an 80s pop group? No. Well, it is technically, but we're not going to talk about that today. Um, is it a popular seasoning? Technically, yes, but also we're not talking about it today, but that's a great idea for a logo. Um, WAM is a new instrumentation DSL for WebAssembly that abstracts above the injection technique. So you can inject your instrumentation by interfacing with some engine. What WAM does is interface with the wizard research engine right now, because that's the only engine that currently supports uh, managing your instrumentation for you or you can perform bytecode rewriting, and this is done through a Rust library called Orca. So what's all this jargon? Why does this even matter in the first case? Let's dig into it. First off, we can all agree that debugging is really difficult, especially when you're trying to debug something like bytecode because it's so low level. And WebAssembly bytecode is growing beyond the browser, which I'm sure everyone in this room knows. Uh, and it's lacking in tooling, but we're wanting to change that fact by enabling building tooling for WebAssembly. So what are some example tools that I'm talking about? For one, we have dynamic analyses, so displaying flame graphs for two developers, uh, displaying coverage uh, statistics about your code as it runs, um, displaying control flow information, so showing the different control flow that occurred as your WebAssembly bytecode executed. And then there's also debuggers, stepping through your code. It's very helpful, as you all know, for developers to be able to do this. And we can build all of these different types of tools with instrumentation, and what I mean by instrumenting a program is injecting some code into a program's execution to do some operation, which is intentionally high-level and generic to encapsulate all these different tools that you can build in this way. It's really limited by your imagination. So there are lots of approaches to instrumenting by code, and let's zoom into the approaches that are currently being used by WAM. For one, WAM can instrument via bytecode rewriting. And when I say bytecode rewriting, it's literally injecting code into the original source. So let's say that I'm wanting to probe this call bytecode in my WebAssembly module. Then I would literally inject more bytecode into my WebAssembly module to perform some monitoring of that bytecode as it gets executed in my engine. And we built a new Rust library called Orca to perform this bytecode injection. This is our repository if you're interested. I know there are some people here that are actually using Orca, um, which is cool because I'm glad that it's not only me that is using this Rust library. Uh, Orca replaces Walrus. Um, that old uh, library is currently being un not being maintained. It also doesn't support the component model. Um, so we ma made this new REST library, which I think is more intuitive for debugging. And the reason why we called it this is because an orca is a walrus's natural predator, um, which is a really fun like play on words that my undergrad and grad student uh, created. So yeah. I think that the API is more intuitive, and it's just easier to debug your instrumented modules here. WAM can also instrument via the wizard engine API. Um, it interfaces with the, with the wizard engine to dynamically attach callbacks to your application as it's being loaded by the engine. So let's say, again, that we're probing this call that will attach this callback, which is written in the Virgil language. So this is the language that is maintained by Ben, who is one of the, he's like the creator of the wizard research engine. Um, and so when you are executing this bytecode in your engine, the engine would see it, there's a callback attached and call this function to looks like increment account. So it's counting the number of times that this call was executed dynamically. And of course, as always in software engineering, there are trade-offs here. You can interface with an engine, or you can do bytecode rewriting, but you have to consider what it really means when you do so. So if you're using instru instrumenting by interfacing with an engine, then you're tying your instrumentation to only being able to run on that engine. So this callback 
it can only run on top of wizard. Whereas with bytecode rewriting, you can run your instrumentation anywhere. You're just injecting more WebAssembly bytecode, which when I say anywhere, it's with some slight caveats um, because you may be creating more dependencies that your engine must supply, but in general, if you don't add more dependencies for your domain, then you can really run your instrumentation anywhere. So when you're thinking about these strategies, you have to choose one that makes sense for your specific domain to write your instrumentation in. But with WAM, you have the best of both worlds, right? Like you can interface with an engine when it's available or use by code rewriting for everything else. So you write instrumentation once and then WAM takes care of your inje injection strategy. With a small caveat, because there are some events that you may want to instrument that are only instrumentable by an engine. So thinking about things that are not observable in bytecode. In bytecode, you can't see when garbage collection is occurring or thread management. You can't even observe when a program's gonna exit. So if you're wanting to instrument these events, you can only do that through an engine. So let's take a look at the anatomy of instrumentation in WAM. For one, you need to have a script that specifies where you wanna inject your instrumentation. And if you need to have um, like more language capabilities that the DSL doesn't provide to you, you can optionally pass also a WebAssembly module that the compiler can use to inject your logic as well. So it's really just these two things where to inject, what to inject. And then when you're injecting via bytecode rewriting, you also supply an application. So the WAM compiler will look at the match rules that you specified, where to match in your application, look in the application for those points, and then inject the logic and output a now instrumented application module. Then when targeting the wizard API, note that the app wasm is no longer an input to the compiler. Instead, the compiler outputs this generic monitor module that then the engine is supposed to look at the application and attach these callbacks that are specified by the match rules that are encoded inside the wasm module. That's the output of the WAM compiler. So the key takeaway is it compiles to either target. So here's an example of monitor and WAM with the syntax. You may notice that it looks similar to the D language for dtrace, because it's inspired by that a bit. So here's your global state. You have where to match. So look inside my application where you see a wasm opcode br if. When to insert, so you want to insert before the br if in this location of my application bytecode. And then we can further constrain that match rule. So PC is a global that's provided by the WAM compiler. So this will get defined. PC means the like a PC offset within a function. So within a function, if I see a BRF at PC offset 25, then this match rule will apply and it'll inject this logic to run dynamically. So how it injects, again, by code rewriting, compile to WASM and inject directly or for targeting wizard, we're wanting to attach this callback, right? But the way that wizard takes instrumentation right now is through that Virgil language, but we're wanting to think through how to retain portability here, right? We wanna to think to a future where hopefully other engines will support instrumentation and being able to manage your instrumentation for you, so we don't wanna tie it to this language that's specific to wizard. We're thinking to this future. So what if we encode our callbacks in a WASM module? So let's dig into how we actually do that right now for wizard, but looking to the future. So we have our global state, which can be emitted as globals in the WASM module. Then we have our body, just compile that to WebAssembly and inject that function. Then we have our match rules. And this is a little bit more interesting, right? Like we have to give context for where this callback needs to be applied in our application. So we do this through just placing it in the import name right now. So the engine will take a look at this, 
find different WASM opcode calls in the application, and if it does, it'll attach this probe body callback. Then we have the further predication to further constrain our match rule. And since we have the WebAssembly language, we can just compile this expression to WebAssembly and return a Boolean result. And then we encode that also in the export name, so saying to the engine, hey, when you see a WASM opcode call, I want you to also evaluate this predicate and conditionally attach callbacks based off of whether or not the result is zero or one. True or false. But there's a little wrinkle here. If the predication involves dynamic data, so this is static data, the argument won't be known until runtime, so there's a little wrinkle here, right? Like, this is evaluated statically. Our application isn't running when we're actually trying to find the locations in our application to attach our callbacks into. So what do we do here? Instead, we can do an analysis to split the predicate into static and dynamic parts. So all the static predication would be inside this predicate function that's run uh, statically at match time. And then the rest of the predicate, that's the dynamic predication, can wrap the body of our probe um, to conditionally execute it at runtime. And we can do some interesting optimizations here. I'm gonna dig into it right now. So for one, like I said before, we can categorize the sub-expressions as static or dynamic. So for this example, that's the static and dynamic uh, categories. In the simplest case, if the expression relies on dynamic data, we could just evaluate dynamically this entire predicate, but there's some static part to this. So we can do something better where we further do an analysis in the compiler when we're targeting um, a, an engine interface. So for the static and dynamic sets, let's generate truth table cases. Here's our truth tables. Now we perform constant propagation for each of these truth table cases to figure out how we can optimize. So here's the truth table for our static part of the predicate. Let's do some constant propagation. So you've substituted A as true, and this simplifies down to true because of um, short circuiting. And then with false, we just get the leftover part of our predicate. And then we can do a similar thing for the dynamic part. We just do constant propagation with this truth table case. Evaluates to true, and so on and so forth. So here's what we have so far with these different truth tables for the static and dynamic part of our predication. Now we collect these results and simplify to see how we can optimize our predicate. So if A is true, we know that we can skip the dynamic predication entirely. If A is false, then we need this specific part of the predicate to execute dynamically. And then this gives us no new information, so we don't really even have to do any more with this dynamic part. So this is what it winds up being. If at match time, we execute these, and we see that PC is 25, then we can attach a probe callback function where it doesn't even have a wrapper around the body. It's just, it executes the body because we know the expression evaluates to true. Whereas if it's false, then we need to attach a pro function callback that has this wrapper around the logic to conditionally execute it at runtime. So notice here that we've removed dynamic checks for every match site, and sometimes it removes all the dynamic checks. So it can make your instrumentation run faster through some interesting analysis by the compiler. So back to our engine integration design, let's zoom in on this match rule real quick because they can get pretty complex pretty quickly because they're having to request different pieces of information from the engine. And I agree with you, like this is pretty gross. Engine implementers aren't gonna wanna have to add this parsing and processing to their engine. So what if we just expose an API where the WAM monitor can find its own matches and attach its own callbacks? And that's a great idea. Maybe an API like this, where it's able to look at the application, get the state from the application that it needs, and dynamically add and remove probe callbacks as it needs to. 
So we're wanting to look into how to actually standardize an engine API for promoting portable instrumentation across engines. Enough talking. Let's do a little demo because I'm excited about it. Um, so this feels really small. Um, is this big enough? Cool. All right. So let's see how cool this thing is. Um, we're going to write a branch monitor to see dynamically um, the different branches that are taken by branching opcodes in the WebAssembly compilation of this Rust code. It's very basic, very short. So let's write a little branch monitor. Um, we can do, well, okay. This is the CLI. Um, we're gonna use this command to get more information about branching opcode events that are available. So, um, so we're gonna get information. We wanna learn about the functions and globals that are available for this specific match rule. These are branching instructions, so let's create a glob match for the branching instructions that are currently supported by the WAM compiler. And this gives some really nice output to see which events are available. You may notice that this isn't all of the branching opcodes, and that's because I haven't had time to support all of them yet, but we're getting there. Um, so let's look at the BR and BRF events specifically. So for one, we wanna profile the branches that are taken by BR. We wanna inject the instrumentation before this BR executes. And we're gonna do a similar thing, but instead of BR, it's going to instrument the BR if opcode. All right, so we wanna do some further predication here. Let's say we want to only see what happens with the branching opcodes and the calc and the printx function specifically. Because uh, Rust creates the custom name section, we can depend on the names of these functions. And WAM gives you this global that will provide you the name of the function the probe is located in. So we can predicate using this, where we wanna only instrument the BR instructions that occur inside functions with the name calc or the name printx. And we wanna do this also for the BRF instruction. All right, we also wanna have a global that you can keep track of the information as it happens dynamically. So let's make a net map called count that keeps track of this. So what I wanna do is also tie the values inside this count um, to the function that was instrumented, the PC offset within that function that the probe was applied to, and the branch that was taken. So this is gonna look like this. and it's going to map to the number of times that it was taken. So branch is an unconditional branching opcode semantically in WebAssembly, so we know that it's always gonna be taken. Oh, I forgot to make this. Uh, this is of U32, U32, I32, and it maps to an I32 count. Cool, so in a BR, it's unconditionally gonna take a branch, so I know that count at these globals that are provided by my WAM compiler again. FID, PC, the taken is gonna be, it just means one for the purpose of this branch monitor. We're gonna assume that if it's a one, it means that the branch was taken. And then we do a similar thing in BR if, but BR if is conditional and it's contingent on the value of the top, on the value of the top of stack. And that's provided through WAM as arg zero. So we're gonna conditionally um, increment the taken branch based off of arg zero. So if arg zero is zero, I know that this branch was not taken, whereas if it was not zero, then it was taken. Cool, 
So now we have a branch monitor written in Wham. Let's do the instrumentation. Um, okay, so we're gonna say, hey Wham, instrument the application at this location. So it's just the compiled output or the compiled WASM module from this Rust code using the following script, which is this branch, this script right here. Cool. Now I can run it. And I see that there's a lot of output here, but I actually don't have any monitor output. And the reason why is because we haven't put any logic to report anything that happened. And what's nice is that there's a language feature for a type of variable called a report variable, and wham, where you can just add this and it'll report to you. The um, default behavior of this report variable is to use WASI to print this to the console. So what we need to do is now that we've added this, we need to re-instrument our application. It's just doing bytecode rewriting, right? You have to re-instrument to inject the different behavior. Let's rerun it. Whoa, we have more output, cool, right? Um, so now you can see that this count variable is reported and you see that there are a bunch of flushes and that's because, remember how I said you can't observe an application exit inside WASM? That would only be visible by the engine. So instead, I'm just flushing every time that count um, variable is dirty. So we see our count. We have our script ID, so that's like the ID of the script that it comes from. We also see that this isn't populated, and this also isn't populated. And the reason why is because this is global state in our branch monitor. It doesn't have any explainability from coming from specific probes. And then we see FID PC taken branch. So at FID 17, PC offset 107, this branch was not taken four times while our ex while our um, application executed. So this is like not very readable, right? Like we've made some nice other language features that automatically make things more readable to you. So let's say that we wanna re-implement our branch monitor using something called unshared variables. So let's make a new unshared variable called taken. What unshared means is for all of the points that this probe is applied in my application, I'm gonna have my own site variable, like instantiation of taken. So in, uh, in, you can have shared or unshared. So if it's unshared, then all the different sites don't have access to the same variable. They have their own instance of it. Whereas if it was unshared, then they would globally have access to a single taken variable. So if I reach this BR, I know that taken gets incremented. Then we can do a similar thing in BR if, but now it's possibly not taken based off of top of stack, the similar logic. If the top of stack is zero, then I know that this branch was not taken, whereas the top of stack is not zero, then I know it was taken. Oops. So this is already a lot more readable, right? We don't have all this weird like tuple FID PC stuff. And what's really nice is when you run this, you have a much more readable output with a lot more explainability to it without all of this weird, just like a ton of flushed map values. So inside here, we know that we have a probe that came from the BRIF probe. So if we were to look at FID 17, PC offset 79, we would see a BRIF instruction. And we know that the branch was taken zero times when the application ran. Whereas if we see a BR at a PC, or sorry, 
FID 17 PCOS at 124, we know that branch was taken four times. So we see like a lot of explainability here and it's all just like default given to you by the DSL. Cool, now that we have a cool demo that we went through, let's talk a bit about the MVP um, that we're gearing toward right now. This DSL is very much under heavy development um, and we're hoping to have the MVP done in the next like month, I would think. Depends on how much time the next projects work uh, require for my class that I'm taking right now. Um, but we've gotten really far, right? We are almost done with the MVP for bytecode rewriting, and we're only gonna add more capability to the wizard side. And I do want to caveat right now, the system requirements for this DSL require that you have multi-memory and that you're able to run on top of WASI. And WASI is because of the report variable uh, behavior that it uses right now. But we have plans to work around this so that you can configure your own report variable behavior. So instead of flushing to um, the console, maybe you want to flush to a file. Maybe you want to stream over the network or pu uh, push uh, to a database or something. I want to make that configurable for people. And where to go after that? like support WASM GC types, instrument components, create this engine API that hopefully can be standardized across engines. Um, we wanna have composable instrumentation, so you can apply multiple instrumentation monitors at once to a single application. Um, I also wanna make cool visualizations with the dynamic analyses that we're creating so the developers can actually debug their code. So what does that look like from a visualization support side for the DSL? I don't know yet, but we'll figure it out. Configurable report variable behavior, how to map observations back to the source. So Orca, we're trying to make it to where if you instrument a module, Orca will retain those changes inside the dwarf metadata. Um, but obviously like dwarf isn't necessarily the whole answer here. Not all languages use dwarf. Um, so what is he helpful for WAM to ensure that you can map your low level observations back to your source code? So like, let's take a step back and look at developer tooling from a bird's eye view. If we have many languages that can compile to WebAssembly, and with WAM you can write instrumentation once and support a really wide domain of applications because of being able to interface with an engine or by code rewriting to support all these other domains. Like, that's a really powerful capability for people that are interested in developer tooling. So what I'm saying is, let's go hack the planet. Anyways, WAM is under development, will be available soon. I'll take any questions people have right now. Yeah. Do you have any uh, sort of numbers and sort of performance overhead? So what is optimizations you've been applying or sort of the general overhead of the instrumentation? Yeah, so Alex was asking about the overhead that instrumentation imposes. I don't yet. Um, so I'm gonna be writing a paper on this at some point. Um, and what I was gonna say. So the performance overhead's gonna obviously be different based off of targeting bytecode rewriting or targeting like interfacing with an engine. Um, there are also some interesting like optimizations that I already showed you about optimizing predication or doing JIT intensification of WAM probes on the wizard engine side. So the uh, measuring of overhead has a lot of complexity there, but I'll have a lot of like more numbers on when it's like further along. Yes. Were the probes themselves uh, little Uh So asking again, were the probes themselves little WebAssembly binaries? like the functions that ran uh, in response to one of the, let's say, like the branch? Oh, yeah, so I can actually, we have a lot of time left. This take, took less time than I thought it would. Um, I can actually just show you. For right now, um, it literally just injects around the location. I wanna make it cleaner to where it injects a function body call, or a function call, um, but. What is the WASM? Oh, uh, to clarify a little bit, yeah. uh, I was talking about the DSL. So if I was understanding, and maybe I'm understanding incorrectly here, but the DSL um, 
that's like the hook, the sort of hooks that are getting attached. Um, what is that compiled down to, right? Like, yeah, the code. Yeah. That so write. when I talked about, wow, this is long. Yeah. So I haven't built this capability yet. That's coming along. Um, so all of this was literally just written in the DSL language. I didn't provide any um, like instrumentation library that it calls out to. So this probe logic literally just gets compiled into WebAssembly opcodes, and then those get injected by the Orca framework. Um, so if you were to look at a BR instruction in the WebAssembly like app.out.wasm, then it's going to have like um, this increment right before it, like in line inside the bytecode. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, yes, it does. Okay. Uh, I had a little bit of a follow-up thing. Yeah, sure. Uh, what do you think about making these probes uh, individual WASM, like WASM modules, and then trying to, like, so rather than, uh, rather than combining them into the binary, but instead combining them as separate binaries and then connecting that, like sort of grouping those binaries together and then using them, like sort of making them self-contained. Um, yeah, so that's kind of what I was talking about with making it a bit cleaner. You would still have to have a call that happens at that point. Um, but yeah, you could either do that by injecting functions or by importing functions at the boundary of the module of the application and then you call out to that imported function. Um, so yeah, there can be like some cleanup of that instead of just directly injecting to the function. Thank you. It would also be more debuggable if you had more, it wouldn't be, it would be more obvious where your instrumentation is because you could see these call sites instead of, oh, if I do a side-by-side -side comparison, I can see that here is my original application, here's that BR instruction, and then boom, like this is the chunk before it. Um, so it'll just be cleaner if it looked like that. Thanks. Yes. I'm curious as an academic, where, where are you going to send this? So I was going to try to send this to PLDI, but the deadline I think is like tomorrow, um, and I have not had time to create a paper. Um, so probably going to be pushing this off to Uppsala or something next year, um, but still figuring that out. All right, yeah, I, I hope you get a very positive reception. I think it would be wonderful to have more of this kind of work uh, be recognized by the academic community. I think, I think there's a lot here that maybe 20 years ago when people were talking about Java and that was like 30, 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Anyway, I, I think that the, these, I think this art is worth recognizing the academic community. I, I hope you find a lot of success there. I hope so too. I think that the story of instrumentation could be a lot better than it is. And I mean, I was talking about this with Victor yesterday. With WebAssembly, like, we really have a great opportunity to make really cool tooling that's language agnostic, platform agnostic, all these different things. So if you, like in the future, if a new language comes on the scene, and if they just create a compiler target that can target WebAssembly, and then WebAssembly has all of this fully fledged out tooling, like they would get all of this tooling for free. Um, which that's obviously like way down the line, but I think that there's like a really compelling story there for the, um, from the side of observability. Hi there, so in your, um, you mentioned that GC types are on the roadmap. Do you have any support for function references? So like if I wanted to instrument like uh, Call and direct, for example, like I'm an engine implementer on SpiderMonkey. So one of the things we've been looking at is like speculative optimizations around calling function references. So I would love to have a way to be able to like instrument call and directs to see what their targets actually end up being at runtime and getting some stati statistics on that. Mm -hmm. um, do you have something for that now or um, is that future work? So I don't think that it currently supports call and direct, but like I'm gonna be doing that as I flesh out the opcodes. And I wanted to zoom in on this. 
So BR table is kind of wonky, um, right? Like you're branching based off of the incoming top of stack, um, which can be, which can target multiple different branches, kind of like a switch. Um, so I have globals that are specific to different opcodes that help you get more insight into what's going on, specifically about that event. Um, so I, I need to zoom into my, the call and direct and what makes sense to support instrumenting that type of event. But it would look something like this, where we have these helpful um, globals to get you more information, specifically like what would be interesting for you. So with call and direct, it would look, it would have this support baked in. Yeah, with um, call and direct specifically, you know, you'd have an index for like what you're getting, and you'd, you'd also have a table index. Right. And then you'd want to have some way to like, well maybe I guess you could just provide what it's finding in the table. Um, so yeah, I don't know the best way to express that. Call ref from the, like, the function references proposal would be simpler, because there you just get the function reference already. Well, a lot of that information would be statically known, right? And then the part that's dynamic would be the top of stack that targets different calls within the table. Um, and so I'll have to think about what globals I would want to support specifically for call and direct to enable that either um, fully static information you want to know or static plus dynamic information to pull out whatever would be true for your, like what occurs dynamically for the call. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. So like, but if I would do that, like, I would need to have support for looking up inside the table that it's targeting as well. So there's a lot of complexity there that would need to be added to the DSL. Yes. Thanks. Yes, I guess this is more of a high level question. Um, you mentioned you know, the opportunity for a developer tool like WASM to be really, really cool in the future. So I was just curious to hear, I guess, your personal opinion on what do you think maybe debugging uh, instrumentation will look like um, for an end user? I'm guessing people probably not even writing MM files directly right with leveraging opcodes. So I don't know, maybe leveraged by a debugger or what do you see there? I feel like the speaker might be really garbled sounding. I might come down and try to hear again. Sure. Sorry. You want me to just tell you? Yeah, you can say it in the microphone. I just, I can't hear super well. Yeah, so I was saying, you mentioned developer tooling with Wasm, the opportunity for it to be very cool. Um, and I was curious to hear your personal opinion on what do you think that will look like sort of for an end user in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so, I don't know, potentially they're not gonna be writing MM files, right. um, maybe leveraging one directly, but maybe they'll be leveraged by a debugger, or sort of how do you see that looking like? Yeah, so I'm hoping that, like, I think a lot of this is going to be mainly used by developer tooling implementers. Like, common developers will never look at this stuff. Um, and so I think, like, uh, I'll still have to think about how this actually gets integrated and put into the hands of developers. But part of what I'm saying about um, this visualization stuff back here, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, so when I'm saying how to support the visualizations, like developers don't wanna see this weird output, right? Like this gives you no information as a developer. Um, so how do you actually like visualize this information? So I'm wanting to do like VS code extensions. Um, so you can have debugging WebAssembly binaries in VS Code or displaying flame graphs in VS Code. Like I think the way to do um, tooling for developers is to put it into IDEs for the most part. Um, or like if you use um, like Emacs or Vim or something, enable some way to visualize that for them. Maybe that's giving HTML so they can show that in a browser or something. I think that it's, I think that's kind of the direction that we'll need to go in for that. 